How is your Lenten commitment going? I gave up, and I gave up on giving up. <laughs> How's it going? Did you give something up? Are you been faithful to that? They're a little bit like New Year's resolutions, right? 40 days, I can make that work. Day five, 40 days, huh? One of my other churches had a guy that gave up uh, biscuits for Lent. And I think he thought Jesus was going to come back before Lent was over. He struggled with, he struggled with that. But, you know, even taking that commitment, you're setting yourself up. I don't know if you realize this, but you are setting yourself up for an internal struggle when you take this commitment. I mean, it's like a New Year's resolution, right? This year, I'm going to exercise three times a week at 6 a.m. And the first 6 a.m. rolls around, and you're like, yeah, at 6.30 a.m., I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this three days. Like, there's this internal thing that kicks in. You're setting yourself up for spiritual internal conflict. Whatever you gave up, <laughs> you're confronted Every time the opportunity to partake comes up, you're confronted with a struggle. So when you make that commitment, you're going, hey, I am going to not do this, or I am going to do this, and I'm going to commit to doing that. And then every time the temptation presents itself, you're like, maybe you can relate to the passage we're going to look at this morning. If that has been your struggle, maybe that's been the struggle of your Christian experience. Let's see if you can relate to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the very evil I do not want to do is what I do. Now, if I do, not do, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Does that sound like your morning challenge with your Lenten connection? <laughs> Does that sound like something that has plagued you throughout your entire Christian experience? I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. I know what I'm not supposed to do. But I do it. I had to read that passage very carefully because it's like, for what I want to do, I don't want to do. And what I don't do, I want to do. Like, there's enough I do's and wants in there to make you really become a tongue twister. But that is our conflict, right? Maybe that's been your Christian experience. Hey, God, I know as a Christian I'm supposed to fill in the blank, but I don't. Or I know I'm supposed to not, but I do. <laughs> and Paul, by the way, the guy that wrote that, those words wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, planted dozens of churches throughout the Mediterranean, and served God with a large portion of his life. And he still struggled to do what God wanted him to do and to not do what God wants him to do. I hope that gets you, it gives you a little piece of grace. That if Paul, who was literally confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and I'm not talking about like just the idea of Jesus knocked from his horse, blinded by the light, confronted with Jesus, still writes those words, then it probably is our experience too. <laughs> we don't have that. We have this, we, we, have, we cannot forget we have Christ in us. But he has that level of experience, does all those things for God and still goes, I'm not sure I do what God wants me to do when I know he wants me to do it. There's still something going on inside of me that makes it hard to be obedient. It's still 
a struggle. Well, he sets this whole passage up with a theological conviction, a theological truth. Look at verse 14. He says this. For we know, so he's telling you, we know as Christians, we know as followers of Christ that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh sold into slavery under sin. There is a theological truth for you. As if you didn't know it. (laughs) We are enslaved on some level to sin. Especially and in particularly before we come to faith in Christ. Before we submit our lives to the authority of Jesus in our life, there is, no, there is no doubt that we are captivated, literally enslaved to sin. Maybe Paul's even writing these words. He's not necessarily talking about the Christian struggle. Maybe he's talking about the pre-Christian struggle. But we are slaves to sin in the sense that even when we know Christ, and this is what he kind of goes off on, he says, I know that God's law is good. I know That the Bible is the way to live. What the Bible says is the way to live. But I don't do it. I I know in my heart it's right. I know right from wrong. But I still struggle. Because I'm in some level, I am enslaved to sin. And what, what he needs to what he wants us to understand is that the law itself, God's rules, God's system, the Ten Commandments, the Bible, cannot save us from sin. Trying to follow all of God's rules will not save you from sin and death. There is no, I did it all. I did what I'm supposed to do. I was faithful to God. I'm saved. Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, planted dozens of churches, had the Old Testament probably memorized, didn't get it all right or keep all the law. There is no keeping it all. In fact, in fact, he, he would say as a Pharisee, yeah, I kept it all, but he kept it all in, in, in the sense of where Jesus says, you say, it says don't murder. I didn't kill anybody. I kept it. Until Jesus says, but if you hate somebody, you've committed murder. We talked about that before, right? So this idea that we can kind of keep the rules, maybe we can even artificially on the, on the outside, on the spiritual front, seem like we're doing pretty good following Jesus And inside that same war is going on. I know I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I did it again. I fell again. And what does that do inside of you when you go, okay, God wants me to live this way. I I can't. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe you've had that moment of doubt where it's like, as a Christian, I'm supposed to do this. But I don't. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Or maybe God won't forgive me this time because I did it again. How many times is he going to forgive me? How many times is he going to be gracious? I mean, I told him I wouldn't do it again, and here I am. I didn't even keep my Lenten commitment. I mean, if we can't keep our, I'm giving up chocolate, how much better are we at keeping all of God's law? Right? I mean, if we can't keep that promise for 40 days, by the way, hey, no chocolate, or I'm giving up coffee, or I'm giving up Facebook, 40 days. And day 10, we're like, I got to know what's going on in the world, Facebook. You know, if we can't keep that rule, what hope or chance do we have keeping the rest of what God expects us to do from a moral standpoint? The law can't save us. It cannot save us. We have a human weakness. We have a slavery to sin in us that keeps us challenged, keeps us struggling, keeps us tripping up. Look at verse 15 again. Now, if I do, I've got to watch all these do's and don'ts. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. That's a great phrase right there. I can will to do right, but I don't. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do, I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin 
that dwells inside of me. So he's acknowledging there's some, there's a, we have a divided self, if you will. There's a part of us that loves God's law and wants to keep, if we have faith, that wants to keep God's faith law and wants to do what God's called us to do. In fact, most of the time what we struggle about is what? What's God's will for my life? I wish I knew what that was. I wish that when I wake up on Monday, he'd go, this is what I want you to wear today. This is who I want you to talk to. This is the career path I'd like you to choose. This is who you should marry. Wouldn't it be nice if that was the script? Here's your to-do list on your phone from Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Would we do it? What if it came down like that? You get up on the Monday morning and your agenda is downloaded from heaven. Would you do it? We say so. But Paul goes, I know what I'm supposed to do. But I don't. We're at war within ourselves. There's this internal conflict. God's will, God's way, my way, sinful way. And he talks about the difference between spirit and flesh. And when he says spirit, he's talking about God's law written in our hearts. When he talks about flesh, he is talking about this sinful nature that's kind of still around with us. And he even he just uses some language in there like, there is nothing good in me at least in my flesh, is the qualifier. And a lot of times we rip that from context and we walk around as Christians going, yep, I'm just a sinner in need of a savior. I'm awful. I'm terrible. I sinned again today and yesterday and the day before. Oh, what was me? <laughs> Almost a spiritual Eeyore, right? It's like, I'm really trying hard today, Jesus. I'm going to really try hard, but I'm still bad. But Paul draws out this separation for a reason. It is sin that is the invader here. We are God's image bearer. I think I shared this a couple weeks ago, or maybe even last week. I share it often. I know I shared it this morning in our discussion over in Lenten Journal. But does your Bible start with Genesis 1 or Genesis 3? We have to be reminded of this, and Paul is going to remind us of this, but this idea is, in Genesis 1, God says, let us make mankind in our image. Male and female, he created them. We're made in the image of God. Now, that has all kinds of theological implications. It doesn't just mean we just look like Jesus, like, look, I got the same hair, cool. It means that we have certain qualities that he's bestowed on us that he has himself, Emotion, free will, creativity. We are his image bearers. We bear certain resemblances to the one who made us. And in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve made in the image of God, living in paradise with God, where they did have the direct download, by the way, walked in the cool of the day with God, still chose to disobey. They had direct conversational access to God in the garden and still ate from the wrong tree. No wonder we struggle, by the way. And in Genesis 3, when God, when that, once Adam and Eve have done that, God comes in and gives an eternal decree that basically says, hey, you're now going to die because you didn't listen to what I had to say, and here's what's going to happen. Here's how this is going to work. Your relationships are going to be a challenge. The creation's not going to just yield fruit the way it did before. Things, everything has been transformed. Everything is broken by sin. Now, my question again is, does your Bible start with, I am an image of a bearer of God, or does your Bible start with, I'm fallen and broken and screwed up? That's an important theological truth to grasp. Because even when Paul says, there is nothing good in me, he's referring to the sinful nature that was broken by the, because of this as a result of the fall. But he also says, I still delight in God's word. Because no sin completely erases the fact that you're God's image bearer. Nothing. You can't out-sin it. You can't wipe it away. You still were made by God for God. You could even say in 1 John, we were created by love for love. Because God is love. We were created by love. God is love. For love. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, and like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the image we were created in. And what we tend to do is walk around going, look how bad I am again. Look how bad I am again. Even at Lent, we're like, okay, I got to repent and give something up that's been a distraction, you know. <laughs> 
I think I told y'all one of my college friends, I said, Lent's coming. They're like, oh no, got to give something up. I got to sacrifice something. It's awful. I feel bad enough without my comfort food. You know, (laughs) what if we're focused in the wrong direction? What if instead of our focus on avoiding sin, avoiding temptation, what if our, instead of our focus being on, I can't have fill in the blank. What if our focus was on how can I love? How can I love God? How can I love my neighbor? What if that was the, all we had to download for our agenda today? What am I going to do today that will demonstrate my love to God and demonstrate his love for other people? What if that was the primary focus versus sin avoidance? What's the most loving thing I can do? What's the most Christ-like thing I can do today versus what I'm giving up or missing out on or hating or don't want to fall into again? What if the whole orientation of our day changed from a sin avoidance, flesh avoidance, to use Paul's words, and turned towards a focus on the Spirit? a focus on God's will for my life. Not in a mechanical, this is what I want you to do today kind of way, but what does God want me to do? He wants me to love. Jesus put it that way, by the way. He said, all of the commandments rest on this one. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have to memorize 10. You don't have to read 5,000. You have to know two. Love God. Love others. But if you love God, you worship him. You don't worship other idols. If you love God, you, don't, you, you, hold, you, hold, you go to church. You don't hold things above him. You, you do all these things. If you're loving God, you're doing those things. If you're loving others, are you jealous? Are you petty? Are you hateful? Are you spiteful? If you're loving them, you don't have to focus on the bad. If your focus is on the good. Sin and temptation still plague us everywhere. But there is an all, you need to understand, there is an already and a not yet dimension to our spiritual walk. And here's what I mean. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you are forgiven. Christ is in you. And the person who walks around like this forgets that. You're not just his image bearer. You're literally, in the scriptures, we're called the temple of God. That Christ dwells right here inside of us. Now, if you're terrible and you're broken and you're awful, is that where Jesus hangs out? Christ is in you already. But sin still plagues us. Paul says, when I'm trying to do good, sin still waits at the door to trip me up. It's still here. It's still a part of me. And that is true in the sense that God loves you even when you mess up. God loves you because you have messed, even when you have messed up. But he doesn't want you to stay messed up. Christ in you is meant to rework you, to remake you, to restore that image completely that's been defaced and trashed by the power of sin. Yes, we still screw up. Paul did. Paul goes, stuff I want to do, I don't do. We still mess it up. We're still plagued by sin. One day, the presence of sin will be removed when Christ returns. See, here's the way to think about it. You were saved when you placed your faith in Christ. The penalty of sin is gone. You're not going to hell. You're not going to die forever. You're going to have eternal life because that penalty has been paid for by Jesus when you profess faith. The power of sin has been broken. It is possible to do what God wants you to do. We don't always do it perfectly, but it is possible to obey God and to follow God's law in a given set of circumstances. It is possible to resist temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no temptation that has given you except what is common to man. I have given you a way out so that you may stand up under it. Paraphrase. But I've given you a way out of every temptation you faced. You have the power if you're not trying to do it all on your own power. 
if you trust in the power of God to do it. You can resist it. Do we resist it all? Of course not, because the power of sin is broken, but it, the presence of sin is still here. So we have been saved. We are being saved. The Holy Spirit in us, Christ in us, is helping us work out and remove sin. It's a church word we call sanctification. Maybe you've heard that word. Because sanctify, to sanctify, to become more and more holy, to become more and more Christ-like, to become a, have a heart that is demonstrating love to God and love to others more and more on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, not just on a Sunday morning, in every respect. And then one day, when Jesus returns, the presence of sin will be gone too. And we won't be able to sin because it's just gone. Evil's defeated. We'll be in God's presence, and sin doesn't rest there. So he saved us from the penalty of sin. He's saving us from the power of sin. And one day he will save us from the presence of sin. Hey, there's three Ps. Nice little preacher thing, right? Three Ps to worry about there. Because it's supposed to sound like this. I know that we struggle with sin and temptation. It's a reality of your experience. It's a reality of my experience. But my question this morning is, should it be that way? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. And everything has become new. Is that your Christian experience? If not, why not? Romans chapter 8. Because this is the very next verse, right? Next few verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, saved from the penalty of sin. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've been set free from the power of sin. For God has done what the law weakened by our flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death. To set the mind on spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Two parts. There, if you belong to Christ, there is no condemnation for sin. So don't set your mind on have I gotten rid of sin today? <laughs> Don't set your mind on the flesh. Set your mind on life in the spirit. Those who are focused on sin and death, those who love sin and death, end up not being able to please God. Perhaps we are, more, we are conflicted more often than not because we're trying to keep the law under our own power. If, that, if your experience has been, I'm dealing with sin again today, I'm dealing with sin again today. I'm dealing with my Lenten commitment again today, whatever. I'm dealing with sin again today. Maybe it's because we're trying to do it on our own. What does he say? Set your mind on things of the Spirit. To set your mind on things above, the way that God is and who God is, that Christ dwells with in you. Perhaps we're so consumed with keeping the law that we're trying to, instead of trying to live by the Spirit, I was a good Christian today. I did this, I did this, I did this. You were a good Christian today, but is that good enough? Perhaps we're so consumed with sin avoidance versus seeking to love perfectly. Perhaps we have forgotten our victory in Christ. We walk around thinking, I'm broken. I'm a messed up sinner. I'm, I can't get it right. I don't do the things I want to do, and I do the things I don't want to do. We, talk, we sound like Paul. And in the very next chapter, he says, there is therefore no condemnation like that. Sin did not erase your image, God's image in you. Christ is in you. You have victory over the power of sin. If you will allow the Spirit to give you that power. Trying to keep a bunch of rules won't work. 
Human weakness has made law impossible as a salvation path. If we could keep the law so that we, didn't, we could be perfect, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. If it was possible to keep all of God's rules and be perfect, perfect, Jesus didn't need to die because the expectation would be, be perfect. What's your experience? <laughs> we need Jesus. But we walk around thinking, we need Jesus. Maybe we should be walking around thinking, I have Jesus inside of me. Not we need Jesus, but I have Jesus. Let's pray. God, this is the real struggle. The pastor struggles, the Sunday school teacher struggles, the worship leader struggles. <laughs> All of us struggle with the fact that we are at war with ourselves. We're at war with ourselves because we belong to you. And we also still are living with the power of sin in our life. Thanks be to you, Jesus, the one who has given us victory over that power. Help us to embrace it. Remind our hearts and minds that it is you who dwells in us. It is your spirit alive in us that matters, that empowers us, that makes us long for the day when you remove sin. It makes us long to love the way you've called us to love. Make that our reality. In Christ's name, amen.